Hello, and welcome to Essentially Friendly Saturdays. My name is Akin, and I'm a host at the Ontario Science Center. Today, I'm joined with Taryn Prasad and Joy Peter from the Geneva Center for Autism. Now, while our audience may be watching from different political divine regions, we are all participating in this event on the land that has been inhabited and cared for by Indigenous peoples since the beginning. I'm speaking to you from Mississauga. Taryn and Joy join us from Toronto, where the Ontario Science Center is located. These places where we are all grateful to live in and work from are territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Chippewa, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat peoples. This land is covered by Treaty 13 and 13A with the Mississaugas of the Credit and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We encourage everyone watching today to learn about people's treaties and histories of the land we live on. One helpful resource is the site whose.land. If this is your first time attending an Essentially Friendly Saturday event, welcome. If you joined us before, it's great to have you here with us again. We'd love to learn a bit about you, so you should see a poll appear on your screen soon. Please take a minute to submit your answers. We'll be using polls throughout the entire presentation today. All your responses are anonymous, and we will only show a general summary of the results on the screen. Take a minute to do that now, please. I'm going to give you about five more seconds. Thank you for sharing your answers. For the past few years, the Interior Science Center and Junior Center for Autism have partnered to facilitate hands-on workshop presentations, discussions for all ages and abilities. Essentially Friendly Saturdays happen on the first Saturday of every month, and we focus on a different topic related to autism spectrum disorder, ASD, each time. We have another poll question, and that should show up on your screen soon. Please take a minute to submit your response. We choose, we'll close the poll in a few seconds. All right, five more seconds. Thank you for sharing your answers. Now, one final thing before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can ask these questions anonymously, and we will be taking the time to answer your question at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to welcome Taryn and Joy from the Geneva Center of Autism, for Autism, sorry. And thank you both so much for joining us today and to talk about visuals and communications. Hi everyone, my name is Taryn Prasad and I'm a Community Options Facilitator at the Geneva Center for Autism. I've been at the Geneva Center for about 16 years, so a very long time, and I'm so proud to be here. Um, I'm a person-directed planner as well, working with adults on the spectrum. Hello, everyone. My name is Joy. Um, I'm an instructor therapist at the Geneva Center for Autism. I've been there for about 10 years now, so again, a little bit of time. And um, I work with our younger kids, so ages two to about eight. And we are gonna to talk to you today about visuals. I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. There we go. So we're gonna start off by talking about what is autism? So autism is um, a lifelong neurological disorder that affects how people communicate and relate to others. The range and intensity of disability varies with each individual, but all people affected by autism have difficulty in varying degrees with social interaction, verbal and nonverbal communication and repetitive behaviors. And what we like to say is once you've met one person with autism, you've only met one person with autism because it is a spectrum, it affects each individual differently. 
Thanks, Joy. So we're going to uh, launch another poll and we want you guys to answer yes or no. If you guys look at the pictures on the screen, can you tell us, do you think these are visuals? About five more seconds. Okay. Well done, guys. Um, yes, they are visuals. So I'm going to show you guys the, the, the next screen. And I want you guys to take a look at these pictures. And let me know if these are visuals. So take a look at these. And what do you guys think? Are these visuals? Yes or no? Five more seconds. Okay. So a little bit of a split. So I'm gonna leave this one. And as we go through the visuals, we're gonna talk all about what these look like and what are actual visual supports. Thank you guys for participating. Okay. What are visual supports? A visual support refers to using a picture or other visual items to communicate with an individual who has difficulty understanding or using language. I want you guys to look at the list here and think about anything that could be a visual because it's not just pictures and that's what we often think about. When we think of visuals, we think that they're pictures, but in actual fact, they can be photographs, they can be drawings. I have lots of clients that are adults who enjoy drawing their own pictures and they create their own visuals just through their own drawings, um, objects, written words and lists. And this is true of all of us. We use all types of visuals throughout our daily um, routines. And that's what we wanna talk to you guys about today. The big part of these visuals is recognizing uh, the importance of, of um, helping individuals with daily routines. So when we use visual supports, they're tools to aid individuals to maintain attention, understand spoken language, sequence events, and organize their environments. Really, when we're looking at visual supports, they're there to increase independence. So that's one of the main things, and then reduce challenging behavior. I want you guys to really think about visual supports and how important they are and how how frustrating it must be for an individual who might not know all the steps so often that's a huge thing that we see we'll see individuals who know some of the steps of a task or will they'll know some of the parts but they haven't learned the entire sequence and that's why we have visual supports to help with that that will aid in their understanding but also reduce that anxiety because it's quite frustrating to want to do a task but not know how to do it well now we're going to talk about choice and we have another poll question for you guys so it's going to launch now So should you offer choice to an individual? Look at me guys, another five seconds to answer. Okay. So most people said yes, and that's fantastic. Yes, offering choice is very important. Um, it's important because when you offer choice, you make the individual an active participant in what's happening in their lives. You can also use choice to determine reinforcement and also increase task engagement and motivation to complete a task. So one way that we do that um, is to use a choice board. So a choice board is a visual support that presents a number of different options for activities or reinforcement. These options can be displayed as objects, drawings, texts, or even photos. So a choice board can be used to communicate choice of an activity, choice of materials to use for an activity, um, choice of a meal. It can also be used to structure free time and activity time, and it can be used to pick a reinforcing item. 
A choice board can be used together with um, a first then board or um, a visual schedule, which we'll talk about a little later. And there are also a few things to consider when offering choice. So one thing to consider is how much choice are you going to offer? Um, I like to think of it as going into Baskin Robbins that has 31 different flavors. And for me, that's a little bit too much choice. Um, for someone else, they might go into Baskin Robbins and take a look at those 31 flavors and instantly be able to decide. So that's one thing to consider when offering choice to the individual. What types of choices are you going to offer? Are you offering choices of reinforcement or are you offering choices um, to complete an activity? Another item to consider is how will these items be represented? Are you gonna use pictures on your choice board? Are you gonna use text? Um, are you gonna use actual objects on your choice board? This would all depend on the individual's um, developmental level. And another thing to consider is, can the individual make a choice? Do they know how to make a choice? So if they don't, that's something that you would need to teach them to do. Um, and that would also, if you're beginning with a choice board, begin with about two choices, um, if this is, if you're just learning to use a choice board. So now we have the first then board or the first then next board. So similar boards, the only difference is that extra piece in the middle for the first then next board. So this board, these boards are used to indicate um, events that will occur first, and then the event that will happen right after that activity. The first then next board, um, again, can use pictures, text. Um, you can even use objects on the first then next board um, to indicate what's going to be occurring. The first part of the board lets the individual know what's coming now. The next is a reinforcing item that they get after the first activity has been completed. If you're using the first then next board, you can have two activities and the then is a reinforcing item for completing the first two activities. This visual aid helps with clarifying expectations um, and can be used to help motivate someone to complete a task. Again, there are a few things that we should consider when using the first then board or the first then next board. Um, one of them is where the board would be placed. We like to keep the board close so that it can be referenced um, frequently so that the individual knows that while they're working on one item, they are gonna get the reinforcement um, coming up. We need to consider again, can the individual understand this visual information? So how are we gonna represent the activity that we're working on first or and the reinforcement that we're gonna get next. Um, and remembering that the with the first then next board or the first then board, that then piece should be a reinforcing item for completing the first two items or the first item um, that the individual is doing. So for the examples we have here, first you would do your homework and then you get rewarded with a Tim Hortons coffee. So I like to think of it as um, we go to work and when we go to work, we get a paycheck. So I first I go to work and then I get a paycheck. Um, Taran and I are Starbucks drinkers. So on a Friday, I like to go to work Friday morning and get a Starbucks. Taran is a little bit of the opposite. She works the whole week Friday. At the end of her day, she gets her Starbucks on her way home. So we're, we all get reinforced we all reinforce ourselves throughout our lives with similar um, first then strategies. Thanks, Joy. So we have another poll, guys. Um, and what we want to look at is what should you consider when implementing a visual schedule? So on the poll, you're going to see uh, four answers and then plus all of the above. We want you to check off the ones that you think pertain. If you think they all do, then you can put all of the above. We'll give you guys five more seconds. Okay. Let's give a little bit more time. Okay. 
So the majority of you guys said all of the above and you guys are correct. We can see how this can be a really tricky question because there's actually so many things to consider when looking at a visual schedule. A visual schedule can be really short um, or it can, it can actually be really long. We can have it as um, a, a weekly schedule or we can have it as a daily schedule. Really it is sequencing uh, the different events that are throughout um, your, your child's day or, or week. So when we look at um, some of these pieces in the poll, we're looking at things like, can that individual manipulate the pictures on the schedule? Meaning, can they take those pictures on and off? So if that schedule is something that's interactive and you're building that schedule with them, can they actually take those pictures on and off? If that's a skill that you're working on, then you want to work on that first before you actually um, start the schedule, because you want them not only to understand what those pictures mean, but the ability to manipulate those pictures and move them around. Does your child actually respond to visual pictures? So again, we talked about in the beginning of this workshop, we talked about not just being pictures. It can be actual objects, it can be photographs, it can be lots of things. So recognizing what they best respond to because that's gonna help you in a visual schedule. And when will you use this visual schedule? Like I said, you know, these visual schedules can be for the entire day. It can be for the week. It can be for the month. And this is true um, of all of us in, in terms of a calendar. We often use these types of schedules. We have little icons on our calendars. We have uh, different things that we change around. We book appointments. We, um, we look at different celebrations, all kinds of things. And we mark them down in our calendars. It's very much the same thing when we look at a visual schedule for um, an individual individual that we're helping. And then also how many pictures and objects, um, words, how, how busy is your schedule? I always think about it as. So for example, uh, if you look at the very top schedule where you have something as simple as toilet, breakfast, you're going to take your medicine, you're going to do, you know, you're brushing teeth, and then you're going to get dressed. That's a really simple schedule for a morning routine. You're only tackling the morning. You're not looking at anything else. And that's where you're going to start with your teaching. Whereas if you look at the schedules on um, the other sides, you can see that one is a whole week schedule and something like that is manipulating each day. And the other one is an entire day schedule. You really want to start small and then build to a bigger schedule. So here we actually have um, a little bit more of uh, a complicated schedule and we use this often with adults so you can see uh this first schedule here is a a very um busy day and very much something that might look like uh for for all of us so you wake up in the morning you have your coffee you got to get to class so you go to your university class you have bills to pay you have research to do you got to do your coast your coursework your homework this particular individual has a job interview on that day because they're seeking employment and then they have a driving lesson later on. So that's a much more complicated day. And that's something that, you know, often we help with understanding how do I manage my time? So as children get older and we look at teens, we look at adults, we look at how can we manage our day and build that independence. If you look at unloading the dishwasher as a schedule, what happens is, is that we're breaking down that task. I challenge all of you guys to really think about what are all the different tasks that you do in one different setting. So for example, with the dishwasher, how many times are you taking out objects? We take for granted that we're just taking out everything and putting it all away. But you can see the fine detail in something like this where you're individually taking out the cups, putting it away. You're taking out the bowls, you're putting it away. And sometimes that real, really detailed setting is needed in order to help an individual understand all of the tasks that are related to, for example, dishwashing. So you want to really make sure that when you're using these visual supports, you're giving an individual as much information as you can about that current activity and helping them to sequence how does it look, right? So for example, you're not doing your coursework before you go to university, because again, your day can be super overwhelming. Okay, we're gonna talk about uh, social stories. So social stories are social learning tools that support the safe and meaningful exchange of information between parents, professionals, and people with autism of all ages. 
A social story is a narrative made up to illustrate certain situations and problems and how people deal with them. Um, to help children and adults with autism understand social norms and learn how to communicate with others appropriately. Social stories were developed by Carol Gray in 1990 and are personalized and usually short, simple, and have defined criteria that make them a social story. So anyone can create a social story as long as they follow some key elements. So some of those elements are identifying a target behavior or a skill or an event that should be in the title of the story. You can use pictures to support the text. It breaks down each event into simple steps. It describes what exactly the individual should do. It's written in the first person and it uses two to five descriptive sentences for each directive sentence. Again, the format is simple and the language is positive. It's always written in the present tense. It describes how others feel um, and how they may react. And it also includes, includes how the individual may feel and how they should or may react in the situation. So when you guys look at social narratives, they're very, very similar to social stories. Social stories, um, as Joy mentioned, um, are really prescriptive in the way that they work. So you wanna make sure that you have the correct sentence form. You wanna make sure that you have the right targets. Whereas social narratives can be a little bit more um, generalized. So you can create social narratives um, for tasks that, for example, might be for everyone. So if you look at, I can wear a mask, as a social story, this is something that you can post and help somebody understand, you know, when they're supposed to be wearing their mask, fitting for the time that we're in right now. Um, and this is something that I often see in classrooms, I'll see in different settings, so that it's just a reminder for anyone that is having to do a task. Whereas um, the social story is a little bit more um, personal. You can also make the social narratives personal as well, um, but you can use them for a general form. If you look at the shaving story, this is a combination of, uh, of words along with those pictures. So really think about, you know, what is the level of understanding for this individual? Do they also need pictures? If you look at the mask story, that's a lot of words. That individual needs to understand sentences to be able to comprehend what the meaning of each script is and then be able to put that into action. Whereas the social narrative that you see on the other side here about shaving, the words are really broken down into each, each uh, word and it has a picture. An individual like this may need uh, supports to understand each thing. Again, when you think about something like shaving, shaving is something that um, most men, most uh, women have to do, right? So when we, when we see what that looks like, how can we break this task down to something understood? Sometimes for an individual who may not understand that, you want to break down each thing into a picture. So for um, this particular social story, we would break down each word and show the the picture so that that person can understand it. So that, for example, if you look at the bottom where you see blade and you see the shaver, we would hold up the object and show the picture so we can pair those two together. And those are the, the, the key parts of teaching. You don't want to just read a social story and hope that an individual understands it. You want to take all of the steps in order to understand how to teach each part. So you might break it down where you're just showing them the parts of something. So for example, for a mask, you might not get to an actual social story yet. You might just want to show them the mask, have them touch the mask, feel the mask, understanding what the mask looks like before you get into, now I have to put this on my face. Often I find that we, we rush through teaching. So we think that if we just um, you know read a story, that will be enough for that understanding. But we really want to take our time and help that individual understand what the expectations are. So while social stories and social narratives are fantastic tools, you want to further break them down so then that way there's an understanding of each and every task. 
the nice thing also about social narratives is that you can make it personal. So, you know, you can call it Joy's story and Joy's story about wearing a mask and, and really make it something that is individualized to Joy's routine. So if, um, if Joy is going to school, that first sentence would be, when I go to school, you know, my name is Joy. When I go to school, I wear my mask. So that that person is identifying with it, much like the social story, but then you can break it down um, to many different things that Joy will have to do within her day to wear the mask. Okay, so this was the very first slide that we did the poll. And uh, some of you felt like these were visuals and some of, that, some of you felt like they were not visuals. The truth is, is that these are actually real life visuals that I have used with my clients. So I'm gonna explain them to you. Sometimes in our adult world, we don't use visuals that look as the typical visuals that we use for kids. So when we look at some of these visuals, we want them to be discreet. We want them to be their own personal reminders and we want them to be something that will aid in their um, ability to be independent. So for example, the very first one where you see that's actually a glasses case. So I have a client that wears glasses um, for reading and wears glasses um, uh, sometimes. And she has that and she uses that when she's in class. She's uh, a chatterbox and she loves to talk to everyone. And because uh, she has such a great personality, everyone likes talking to her too, but that becomes really super disruptive in class. That's something that her teacher has spoken to her about and something that she's had a really hard time understanding why she can't do it. So what we did was we created this really simple script inside of the glasses case so that no one else would see it. It's a reminder for her. She takes out her glasses case every day for her class. And when she opens that up, it's a reminder that if she has thoughts, she can write them down in a notebook and she can say them later. But this just aids in not only her independence, but her anxiety around not talking to other people and recognizing that she can do it after class. The picture that has the masks and the car keys and the wallet and um, uh, the sanitizer and all of that stuff. Again, it's, it's very fitting for the time that we're in. That's a picture that I actually found on Google that captured very much all the things that my client needs to take with them when they leave the house. So what we did is we just simply put that picture up by the door, that very simple picture that looks like an everyday picture, that's not something that anybody else would probably wonder what it is, is a reminder for him that he's got to grab his sanitizer, he's got to grab his masks, he's got to get his phone, he's got to get his keys, and he's got to get his wallet before he leaves that door. Often what was happening before this is that because we're in this new world of COVID, he was forgetting things like his masks, he was forgetting things like his sanitizer. So he would get all the way to the store and then forget that he needed his mask and have to walk all the way back. So this just adds as a little reminder, he's in a place with other people and he really was conscious about having these visuals around and not people knowing what they were. The bottom one with the phone, I can safely say it's all of us, right? We all have a calendar of some sort. So this calendar, as you can see, is color co coordinated. So a calendar like this is based on, again, blue might be school, green might be fun stuff, yellow might be work stuff, you know, brown might be uh, family stuff. We can make it so that we identify each type of task, but it's in your calendar. I know for myself, I would be absolutely lost if I did not put my appointments or if I did not put the things that were happening in my day or my week in my calendar. We often get so busy and we think that we take for granted the calendar. But in, in truth, it's something that our clients need as well when they're managing their school schedules, when they're managing their, um, their, their home life, when they're managing the real world of things like bills and um, you know, tasks. I have a, an individual that I work with and um, grocery shopping was amazing. Buying cleaning supplies, not so much because it wasn't preferred. It wasn't something that he enjoyed. He didn't like cleaning and he didn't like um, buying those things. So he would just forget about it because it wasn't something that was important. We actually put it in his calendar. So then that way he understood that that was something that he um, needed to do as part of his task. 
The very last one is again, a picture, a very simple picture that we found on Google. Google is fantastic. I highly recommend it for finding any kind of picture that uh, might be supportive to your, um, your, your child's learning or, or your student's learning. This picture is very simply a reminder of what do you need for class? I need my notebooks. I need my cal I need my calculator because I'm doing math. I need my ruler. I need uh, pencils, pencil crayons for art. I need uh, pens. I need my binders. I need my paper. This is actually a screensaver that we used for an individual that I work with. And this screensaver looks like all of all of our screensavers, anything that we, you would choose. It could be a puppy or it could be this. Nobody would would question what it looks like. When my client opens up their computer, their laptop, and they sit down for class, no one knows that this is a visual for her. So she now will take out all of these things that are now actually the reminder for her class. So it's a very nice, simple reminder. So lastly, um, I'm a very big fan of WikiHow. If you guys have not used this website, it is phenomenal just simply for any tasks. Joy and I had this conversation last week about, uh, you know, you name it, WikiHow will tell you how to do it. Um, I love it because they've got fantastic uh, pictures and you can uh, use the snippet tool to um, copy that picture and then add your own text. So while the descriptions might be difficult for an uh, individual to understand, the pictures are fantastic and really help support you know, what the expectation is. Very similar to the gas station. If you press that button and say, you know, I don't know how to pump gas, you can be sure that that gas station attendant is going to intercom you back and say, there's a picture that can tell you all the different steps right by the gas station. And that visual is a very real example of a visual that, that many individuals on the spectrum would need. The picture on the TTC here, again, we are in a time of COVID. So uh, sitting at the TTC in different spots is really confusing. Where can you sit? Where should you sit? What should you do? What is safe? So what we did is we mapped out through these X's. If there is an individual on these X's, then you sit on the opposite side. And we talked very, we had a re very real conversation about where that person would sit. Now that individual puts that visual in their wallet. And when they are confused, they pull that visual out in order to figure out where can I navigate on the TTC in order to set. So these are just very real examples of the types of visuals you can do and use. Often, again, you know, we think about visuals in a way that um, they're those animated pictures, but in actual fact, it's true for all of us. We can use any type of picture, photograph, object um, in, in order to aid in the transition of um, an object, uh, sorry, of a, um, a schedule or a, um, a routine that we're supposed to be doing. Lastly, um, one of the big things that we often use, again, in the adult word world is different apps. So um, ChoiceWorks is actually a really great app that we use where you can um, actually put in all of the different choices. So Joy earlier spoke about a choice board. You can put in all of the different choices and it will read out those choices to that person or they can click and move it over. And again, it's something that's discreet because it's on the iPad. And um, I know a lot of individuals enjoy the iPad or enjoy um, digital technology of some sort. So that's something that might be um, enjoyable for you to use. So that brings us to the end. Um, on the chat, I know that there will be some resources um, added. You can find many resources through um, Autism Ontario. Geneva Centre has some great resources. I highly, highly recommend Connectability. They've got a ton of resources in terms of um, social stories, um, visuals, and just regular information about how to create visuals. So they're actually a great uh, place as well. Thank you, everybody. Wow, thank you, Joy and Tarin, for the presentation. Uh, we will now be opening the floor for questions from the audience. We haven't already asked any. Remember that you can submit your questions uh, using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. 
So our first question here, we have coming from Asima. Uh, will you send us the links for the slides and the visual schedule? Next time, direct that, uh, Taryn. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we can do that, Joy. For sure. Yeah, we can get those. Um, we'll send them to. We can we'll send them to available to you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Awesome. And so Asim also Asima also asked. I'm curious to know how to create these schedules and social stories on a live platform. So oh. using, sorry, Joy, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Tara. No, I was, I was just gonna ask for clarification. So is it using, is, are we talking about um, doing therapy or doing online classes and how to use visuals? And so I guess I've seen a couple of a similar questions. So I think they're all getting the same idea as to just kind of uh, how is it done? in terms of, is there some kind of application, some kind of support? And so someone's also asked, uh, how can you support older kids and young adults in being involved in creating these visual schedules? So, so maybe we'll, we'll answer the first question, Joy, um, okay. about using them oh, online. So have you been using your visuals online? How have you been using them? Yeah, so um, since we've moved to online learning, um, and teaching, we use a, the basics, PowerPoint and Word. So when thinking of creating these visuals, they don't have to be fancy to serve the purpose. Um, I've worked with parents where we've just taken Polaroid pictures, stuck them on a piece of cardboard, and they serve the same function as um, something that's elaborate in some of the visuals that you've seen that we presented um, as pictures in the visual. Um, in the presentation. So when you create them, you can hand draw them. I've used post-its actually with clients, um, taking the post-it and just writing out on each post-it what it is. And then once it's done, we just remove the post-it. That's also good for if things are changing very quickly. Um, it's very easy to draw a picture or write on a post-it um, and then use that as part of the schedule. If we're using online, you can, again, just use pictures um, you can put those pictures in a PowerPoint and just present them, um, have them on your screen constantly so that there is always, um, and what we do is we highlight them. So if we're working on reading, then reading is on our schedule and it's highlighted. Um, just putting a, a border around it, it works well for our clients. Um, again, we're not always using super fancy technology. It's, um, we can just use the basics and it does serve the same purpose. Often the same thing happens um, for adults too. The nice thing, um, and I'll just tie it into the question about how you can bring um, adults uh, and older kids um, involved in creating these schedules. Often um, I, I find that um, there's, there's a, a certain level of excitement to create that independence for themselves. So when you give that control in terms of choosing the right pictures. So again, like I said, Google is fantastic for different types of pictures. I will often have clients um, where we will go to Google and um, to the same way that we screen shared the PowerPoint today, I will screen share through, um, through, through my session. Uh, Google and they will pick those pictures that they want. We will take those pictures and then embed them into, um, as Joy said, like a Word document. So then th therefore it's their picture. I have other families that I work with where those families will actually take real pictures of that client doing different tasks. And those, um, those pictures are used on a schedule that they have on their side. So for example, um, because we've done some of that prerequisite teaching, as we talked about earlier, where there's an understanding of the picture, there's an understanding of the expectation, I will say, okay, everybody get out your, you know, your first end boards and, and tell me what you have going on. And then they'll let me know, um, you know, whatever that task is. So, okay, we're going to do this. And then I'm going to get to go over here. Fantastic. Especially for uh, my clients who I know lack motivation with a lot of things. We, we spend a lot of time picking motivation. So uh, picking pictures or finding representation. So um, very much when we talk about objects, you guys saw on the slideshow, there was uh, the first then board with a gentleman who had... Um, a gentleman that was was studying and then the picture of Tim Hortons. I have um, a gentleman that I work with and he actually puts the Tim Hortons reusable cup in front of him 
he will take that to, um, he actually prefers studying at, um, at like a study hall at uh, college. So he finds like a, a quiet space. He likes going there. He'll have it there. And we set a timer. We set a timer for an hour of studying. And then he'll do that. He'll check in with me and he'll let me know how he did. Um, and then again, he'll check in with me and let me know he's on his way to Tim Hortons to get his, uh, his coffee. So, I mean, I think there's lots of ways that you can encourage um, individuals to be a part of it, especially when it comes to the reinforcement section of all of these visuals. None of these visuals are usually without some form of reinforcement, right? So um, if you can have them involved in that, that's a huge part of it. Also just wanna add that some of the visuals in the presentation, so like the first end board, the choice board, um, some of the schedule visuals are on our website. So www.autism.net um, and they are free to download. As well as Connectability has them. All right, awesome, thank you. So I have another question here directed at the Science Center, I guess. Uh, does the Science Center have a social story? And so I can kind of answer that. I know we've developed, uh, first of all, the Science Center is closed physically, but we are open virtually. We've developed a social story in partnership with Geneva Center for Autism, and it's located in the accessibility page of our website. I hope that's correct, right, Taryn? I think so, Joy. <laughs> we've got three way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And so I have another question here, anonymously asked. Uh, do you have resources for social stories or other relating to COVID like mask wearing or any expectations in stores? So, uh, sorry, Joy, I was just gonna say Connectability actually has a set of resources. Holland Bloorview also has um, a page. If you go onto Holland Bloorview's page, you can, um, there's a whole COVID section and there they have social stories, they have mask wearing, they have lots of different things and you can modify, you can use those as a base and modify those stories. There was also one for um, being home on our website as well, a COVID social story. For older individuals, CAMH also has um, social stories and information about uh, mask wearing and COVID safety. All right, thank you. I have a question here from Megan with the visual supports. In the picture of the key and the mask wallet, a photo, or is, uh, sorry, give me a second. With the visual supports, is the picture of the keys and the mask wallet a photo, or is it those typical things uh, sitting near the door? So for, for that actual um, client, we started off with all of those items. So we started off with the actual items. So the actual items were all sitting near the door. The, the picture then added, um, added, added as a tool to fade away um, those props. So he was able to um, have them wherever it was in the house and just need the picture that he could have either in his wallet or by the door to um, remind him of what the expectation is. So often we'll start with real objects so that we know what the expectation is and then we'll move to the picture. All right, thank you. I have a question here from Mandy. It says, uh, this is for you, Joy. It says, what tools or strategies are better suited for adults 18 to 20? I'll actually let Taryn answer that. <laughs> our adult. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, can you repeat the question, Arkin? Uh, sorry. It says, uh, Mandy asked, what tools or strategies are better suited for adults 18 to 20? So uh, tools and strategies using visuals? Um, like for all visuals, is, is that the question? So it doesn't specify. So, um, so. yeah, so, so often, um, again, you know, for Joy and myself, we created this workshop, um, you know, in hopes to recognize that the, the base of all of these visuals is the same for children or adults or teens. When you're teaching, it looks very much the same. It's the types of visuals that we use that differs. So often uh, 18 to 20 or, you know, even 18 and older, I would just say, um, when we use those visuals, you know, there's, there's often a stigma attached to those visuals um, from the person. The person feels, um, you know, I've had many individuals who say to me, you know, Taryn, I don't want to use visuals or I don't want anybody to see these reminders. And um, that 
becomes a really hard discussion in terms of, well, what do we need to support this task? That's why we start getting really creative about the ways. That's why we, I wanted to share with you guys the glasses case or the screensaver on a laptop. I think one of the big things is recognizing what kind of support does that individual need? So um, if you're creating a social story, if you're creating a narrative, if you're creating um, just a simple picture, are you going to be using, you know, thinking about all the things um, that that individual needs? Are you going to be using um, something on their phone? Are they really tech savvy? Are you going to be using something that they can keep in their wallet or their purse? I have lots of um, individuals who carry purses and those purses are filled with all kinds of visuals and things like that, that um, helps them with their everyday, um, everyday world. I think it's, it's, it's a matter of getting creative in order to um, have the appropriate visuals that they will be motivated to use. Right, awesome. So I have another question here, anonymously asked. Uh, curious about your online success now that you now you have to work virtually with them. Can you comment or give examples of successes or uh, issues you had? Maybe challenges. I direct that, I guess, at Joy. For sure. Um, now that we're working virtually, it's definitely different than working in center. Um, I work in the intensive behavioral intervention um, area of Geneva Center, so it's definitely different. Um, what we do is just we're working with parents. We're implementing a lot of visuals, actually, as I work with uh, younger ones, we do use a lot of visuals um, and having that transferred to home. So again, like I said, I had a parent that took Polaroid pictures and made a schedule for their child because um, they were making those resources to help them be successful um, in their learning, not only with us, but also at school. Um, and it really helped. So every individual is different and every family is different um, in terms of the challenges that we see, but we're all, um, it's a tough time and we're all working through it together. One of the um, features on Zoom is a whiteboard, and I often use that with my adults. So with the whiteboard, um, Zoom has a feature where um, you can have an, another individual participate in using that whiteboard. So both of you guys can write at the same time. So the teacher or the parent or, or the individual, and then uh, the participant can also write at the same time. And um, it's fantastic because you can create things like uh, schedules, you can create outlines. I do often do an agenda for, for my sessions. So, you know, what are we gonna talk about today? Often there are things that they want to talk about and things that I want to talk about. So we will intersperse them after, you know, we've discussed what, what um, is on the agenda they will actually move over each part because they have control over the whiteboard. Sometimes, you know, talking on, on camera is, is really difficult. Sometimes interacting um, is really challenging. I always allow my uh, clients to take their screen off so that if you don't feel comfortable with your camera on, you can take your screen off because I know that they're participating because they're using the whiteboard and interacting with me that way or they're using the chat function. So I think that you know a, a big thing is recognizing where is um, that individual in, in terms of their understanding of technology how receptive are they, their attention skills? What does that look like? And can you ease some of that anxiety by just simply taking off a camera or having them as control of some of those activities? You'll be surprised how far you can go with just those little, those little things. All right, thank you. I would get a lot of questions. And so uh, if we don't get your questions during the live, we will uh, get to you by email afterwards. So. Our next question here from Christina. Do you ever try to fade out the pictures and keep words only for the schedule? I know a lot of coworkers of mine feel that for older grades, pictures are not always age appropriate. That's not to you, Taryn. Yeah, so again, this is why um, we often try to use discrete forms of visuals. So um, 
you know, I, I don't agree with um, the notion that pictures aren't appropriate for adults because I think it's the type of pictures that we use in order to look at appropriateness. So while yes, maybe a cartoon photo might not be, well, actually that's an oxymoron. It's not a cartoon photo, but it's actually um, like a cartoon drawing or an animation or something like that. Um, while that may appear to be something that is not um, age appropriate, you're really looking at what is the child or what is the individual most comfortable with. As I mentioned before, I have individuals who love drawing animated photos or animated pictures. So if you have an individual who loves drawing those pictures, why wouldn't you use them as their own visual, right? So I think that one of the big things that we want to do here is break down the stereotypes of visuals because we actually all use them right there's something that we all see if I give you guys a word today and you don't have a clue of what it what it is you're going to go onto google images and look for what that item is because that's how we all learn so if we can find ways to fade that away to just words fantastic but if those were those pictures are needed they don't have to be you know ginormous pictures they can be small pictures they can be hidden they can be put in the backpacks they, you know there's all kinds of things that you can do if if uh, reading a sentence or um, reading um, words is, is that comprehension is not there for an individual, then you're really doing an injustice by, by not adding the picture. So that's why the picture is so important. It helps aid in that understanding. So really assess where that individual is and what that looks like. All right, thank you. Uh, I have an anonymous question here. Can you recommend a choice board app for Android in particular. And I'll send that over to Joy. I don't know, unfortunately, of any um, Android friendly apps. Karen, I don't know if you know of any. Um, yeah, so um, not for younger kids. I know that, um, so the Choice Sports is um, something that is uh, for Apple, um, but there is Color Notes. So Color Notes is something that you can use for Android, but it, it likely is something that you will use for an, um, an older uh, child, maybe teens or adults, because it, it really is different colored lists. So they color coordinate the list. So you might have one list for groceries and one list for um, daily activities. And it actually has um, check boxes. So you can check off each one. Um, and that's something that's super discreet that you can use as well. And that's, that's an Android app. Awesome. All right, so we have time for about one or two more questions. I have a question here from Josie. It says, so would the first stand board be used for the child that keeps asking for say lunch or the daily schedule? How do you get them to get back on track? And that's where for you, Aaron. I'll, I'll let Joy take that one because um, I think that's probably something that she encounters quite a bit. It is something definitely that I encounter quite a bit. Who doesn't love lunch, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> definitely the, the first stand board can be used. Um, in conjunction with the daily schedule. So you can use them both together. So you have your daily schedule that says that lunch is coming up. You can put that and say, first, we're going to do, let's say, writing, and then we're going to get to go to lunch. If it's like a first, then next, and you have a few things that come before lunch, it could be like, because lunch is that reinforcing item. They really want to eat that lunch. So you could have like first writing, then math, and then lunch. And then you just keep referring to that. Like, look, lunch is coming. First, we're going to do our writing, and then we're going to get lunchtime. All right. Awesome. Thank you once again. And so that is all the time we have for questions. Uh, once again, any questions that aren't answered, we'll, we'll answer you in the follow-up email. And so thank you for coming, for joining us today for this live. And big thank you to Tyron and Joy for taking the time to share experience with us. And any final, final words for our audience, Joy or Tyron? I think, um, you know, whenever we learn a new skill, it, it can be really overwhelming. It can be really hard to kind of think about, you know, where am I going to start or what does it look like? So, you know, during this time, as you're trying to navigate which is the best visual to use or, or what can I 
what can I use or what, what is my child going to be the most into? Um, you know, I think that you want to take your time with it and, and, and be kind to yourself and, and recognize that each step is important and start slowly, right? So you might just want to introduce certain tasks or introduce some pictures. So then that way, uh, there's, there's an understanding of what they actually mean before you go into the actual visuals. And then, and then you can kind of try from there and recognizing that, you know, it's not something that that works right away. So often we have families, you know, other professionals, individuals that will try visuals and they will say, um, uh, you know, it didn't work. But but the truth is, is that we we didn't put the um, time in, in in terms of teaching each step or or we didn't uh, give that individual time to to learn each part. So, again, take your time and, you know, try to make it fun. All right, thank you, Taryn. Uh, we invite everyone watching today to subscribe to our newsletters for details about upcoming events. Be sure to link in the chat. You can also check out Plan Your Visit section of our website on terrorsciencecenter.ca for information and videos of past Century Friday Saturdays. We'd love to hear about your thoughts today about today's events. Uh, if you have any suggestions for future Century Friendly Saturday topics, please take a minute to answer a short little poll or survey that you can have in come up in your internet browser uh, once the uh, call ends. So join us June 5th, 2021 uh, for our next Century Friendly Saturday workshop. Stay safe, everyone. See you soon and goodbye.